God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, my brothers. Thank you for leading us all morning and leading us well uh, to the throne of grace as we give God praise and honor. If you've got a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn with me this morning to the book of 1 John chapter 4. The book of 1 John chapter 4. We've been looking through this book over the last several weeks verse by verse and just asking God to teach us and to reveal himself to us through these pages. If you don't have a copy of God's word but would like to read along with us, there should be a copy of Blue Bible in front of you and hopefully you can read along with us. Let me ask you to continue to remember Linda's mom in prayer. She is progressing slowly. Though she seems to be past physical danger, she is very much involved in physical therapy and so there's a lot of things still going on with her that I know she she and her mother would deeply appreciate that. And then also Larissa's grandfather passed away last night. So remember her and that family as they go through that season of sorrow for the loss of a family member. I want to draw your attention to this powerful little passage. It's not easy to preach. There's a lot of doctrine that's in this text. And yet we're called to build our life on God's truths. And so these are essential truths for our faith this morning. I draw your attention to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. If you're there, would you say amen? The Word of God says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the Spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the songs of Zion. Thank you for the gifts of God's people, the offerings that they've presented. Thank you for the prayers that have been lifted. Now I pray, God, as we worship you through the reading and preaching of your word, Father, give me boldness of speech and clarity of mind. Give us hearts to hear and ears that would receive what you have for us today. Lord, we want more than information. What we need is transformation. And so may the gospel be presented powerfully and plainly that the hearts and lives of people will be transformed by your spirit. Teach us today, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I am sure that if you've lived long enough, you've probably ran a three-legged race. Uh, I hate those things. I don't know about you. There's two people that run the race, but they tie their inside leg one to another and off they go. And often their design is to run down the field, surround a cone, and make it back before the other uh, contestants do as well. Now that sounds fairly simple, except for the fact generally the two people that are tied together, they don't run in the same stride, they don't run with the same speed, they don't run with the same intensity and desire and competitiveness. So eventually what you have is somebody dragging someone down the field and dragging them on back. It's interesting that if you were able to take those two people and rather than tie them together, you were to meld them together, then they could run more effectively and more efficiently. This thing of being melded together, being made one, is what John has been talking about when he talks about abiding in Christ. He says, I'm to abide in, in Christ and Christ abides in me. You actually see this word surface in chapter 3, verse 24. It's a critical thing to understand. John uses this imagery of abiding in John 15, 5, for example, when he says, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. We know that a branch abides in a vine. It's not connected by glue. It's not connected by nails. But rather, the branch is a product of the vine that produces fruit that comes from strength that flows through the vine. Now the Bible says that you and I that belong to him by faith, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And then if you notice in verse 24 of chapter 3, the Bible says the way that we know that we really belong to Christ, that Christ is in us and we are in him, we know this because of the Spirit of God. In fact, let me read the verse for you in verse 24. 
The Bible says, now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him. There's that word abide, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, there it is again, by the spirit whom he has given us. It's rather interesting, isn't it? How do I know that I'm saved? How do I know the spirit of God lives within me? I know this because God says everyone who belongs to them has the spirit living in them. In fact, Romans would tell us that if we don't have the Spirit of God, we are none of His. Paul would say this a little more emphatically in Romans chapter 8, a verse of Scripture I have on the wall hopefully for you. Notice he says here in Romans 8, 16, 16, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. How, what's one way that I know that I'm saved? One way that I know that I belong to God? Well, when I was saved, He placed within me and within you the very presence of the Spirit of God within us. We're not saved unless the Spirit of God lives inside of us. The Spirit of God saves us. The Spirit of God seals us. The Spirit of God gives us the assurance in our heart. But look at chapter 4, verse 1. Because John begins to raise a warning flag for us because he warns us not to believe every spirit. That just because you have a feeling within you, just because you feel a certain way, John is reminding you you ought not to be trusting your feelings. Because sometimes there is a Holy Spirit and then sometimes there are unholy spirits. Not every spirit, not every emotion, not every feeling you have comes from God. The Bible teaches that Satan is able to transform his messengers into angels of light. So how do I know when God is speaking to me and moving inside of me? And how do I recognize when it's not God and it's a something from another source? Uh, I want to show you a 30-second commercial. You'll, you'll recognize this, some of you that are of another generation, but I, I think it'll resonate well where I want to go with this text. Let's look at this. Hey, Mike, where do you have to? Uh, just diagramming this accident with my State Farm Pocket Agent app. Hmm. You can also get a quote and pay your premium with this thing. I thought State Farm didn't have all those apps. Where'd you hear that? The Internet. And you believed it? Yeah. They can't put anything on the Internet that isn't true. Where'd you hear that? The, the internet. internet. Oh, look. Here comes my date. I met him on the Internet. He's a French model. Uh, bonjour. <laughs> Stay far. All right, there you go. She didn't know any different, right? Because she was trusting what she was reading on the internet. How do you know when the Spirit of God's moving in you? How do you know it's the Spirit of God and not an unholy spirit? Well, again, look at verse number one, because the Bible tells us that we ought to test the spirits. Do you see that? That word test means to test for authenticity. God has provided a test that we can let what we can take to determine whether we're truly saved and whether what's really in us is of the Lord. Uh, several years ago in 18, 1849, there was gold that was discovered at Sutter's Mill in California. And miners from all over the world began to converge in California, what we now know as the California Gold Rush. And they converged in California, specifically San Francisco. During those days, the population of San Francisco was 1,000 people. But within two years, it ballooned to over 20,000 people, people coming in looking for gold. Hence, the football team of San Francisco is called the San Francisco 49ers, right? Because of the miners that converged in 1849. You can imagine when somebody found a chunk of gold, how thrilled they were. Not very many people got rich in the gold rich, except the merchants who sold mer merchandise to the guys who were coming in and mining. But if someone found a great big chunk of gold, they would take it down to get it for cash, only to discover that many of their discoveries that it wasn't real gold, but it was fool's gold. They would determine that by taking nitric acid, the guys who were buying the gold, and they would pour a few drops on the gold, and if it corroded, it was a demonstration that it was not real gold. And so I have a question for you this morning. What is the acid test in the Bible that the Bible gives us to determine whether the true Spirit of God lives inside of us? Let me tell you why this is important and why you need to pay attention to what the Word of God says to us today. If you have the wrong spirit in you, not only will you be messed up in life, you'll miss eternity. But if you have the right spirit within you, he'll not only guide you through life, but he'll seal you and secure you under the day of redemption. You want to leave here this morning absolutely sure that the spirit that lives within you is the Holy Spirit and not an unholy spirit. So what is the test? 
that God gives us. That's what this text is going to help us with this morning. I think there are two basic questions that every Christian or every person ought to ask themselves concerning the truths that we're talking about this morning. Question number one is, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? Seems very simple, but it's not insignificant. You remember that in Matthew chapter 16, the pivotal turning point of Jesus' ministry is when he asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they give him a variety of answers. And then Jesus says pointedly, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I would tell you that the spirit of truth will always exalt Jesus Christ. You need to jot this thought down. Because it matters what you think and what you believe about Jesus Christ. And if I have the spirit of truth living in me, then the spirit of truth will always exalt and honor and glorify Jesus. Let me read it to you in verse number 2 in the text this morning. The Bible says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Here's how you know what is true. He says, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Isn't that a strange text to say? Uh, Look at the text there. There's a title given to Jesus. He's called Jesus Christ, right? That's not his first and last name. You know that, don't you? The name Jesus is a name given to him describing his humanity. Jesus was completely human. The name Christ is a name given to him for his divinity. He was not only completely human, but he was also completely divine. 100% man and 100% God. In fact, when you read the Christmas story of Jesus being born in Bethlehem, it's more than a tender and sweet story of a mother giving birth to a baby, but rather it's the story of a virgin giving birth to God in the flesh. It's important to understand that when you read the scriptures, the, the Bible itself makes much of Jesus. And in fact, when I study scripture, here's what I find out about Jesus. In Revelation chapter 4 and 5, Jesus is the centerpiece of heaven. Did you know that? Did you know all angels worship Jesus? Did you know all of heaven bows before Jesus and glorifies him and honors him? He's, he's the centerpiece of heaven. When I read God's word, Jesus is the centerpiece of the Bible. He comes in the volume of the book according to Hebrews 10, 7. From Genesis through Revelation, the entire Bible is about Jesus. As I preached a few minutes about that last week. When I read Colossians chapter 118, Jesus is the head of the church. He's the centerpiece of the church. I'm the pastor and we have leadership, but we're not the head. We're part of the body, which you and I are a part of. Now watch what happens. The Holy Spirit reminds me today that Jesus is the centerpiece of heaven. Jesus is the centerpiece of the Bible. Jesus is the centerpiece of his church. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to put a spotlight on Jesus and to make much of Jesus. Watch what happens in John chapter 16. Jesus, in talking about the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit, describes his spirit work like this. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. Watch this. The spirit of truth will glorify me, Jesus, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Let me help you understand this just a little bit. When you go to the movie theater, not the, not the film theater, but a live theater, stage production, they'll have spotlights that are highlighting. The spotlight, the purpose of a spotlight is not to highlight itself, but the purpose of the spotlight is to highlight what's happening on the stage, right? The role of the Holy Spirit, he never comes to shine the spotlight on himself. The role of the Holy Spirit is to make much of Jesus, to focus on him, to magnify him, glorify him, so that in the very end, the Bible says God has given to Jesus a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whenever you have the Holy Spirit in operation, his main focus is to focus our attention on Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. If you understand that, say amen. Now the converse is also true. Look at verse number 3. Just as the Holy Spirit will make much of Jesus, so a false spirit or a spirit of error will diminish or minimize the person of Jesus. Look at verse number 3. Very critical. 
He says, in every spirit that does not confess, agree, acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now already is in the world. I discover when I read these verses that the Bible teaches us that these spirits, these, that in the first century there was a group of heretics called the Gnostics. In John's day when he's writing this text, the Gnostics were people who felt they had special knowledge or revelation of Jesus. And they were teaching that all matter, all physical matter was evil. Therefore, they said it is true that Jesus is God, but it's not true that Jesus was a physical man. They're saying that he simply looked like a man or appeared like a man. But I will tell you that John would come along and say that is the spirit of Antichrist. The word Antichrist means against Christ. Jesus clearly, the Bible teaches, is completely God and he is completely man. And anybody who would come along and diminish either his deity or his humanity is demonstrating the same spirit as the Antichrist. Now, there is an antichrist one day who will rise from the political sea of life and dominate the world. Those days are coming. I don't think they're far off. But the spirit of antichrist has been around for over 2,000 years. There have always been those who have looked at Jesus and tried to teach us that he's not what the Bible teaches us that he is. Sometimes their words are easy to detect. Maybe they say something like this on the History Channel. We've got a special this week on the real Jesus. As if the Jesus we're reading in the Bible is not a real Jesus. And so what they try to do is present a different Jesus. I'm telling you that anybody that takes away from the deity or the humanity of Jesus Christ is presenting a different Jesus. Sometimes the deception is very clear. For example, let me give you a couple illustrations. Islam is one of the fastest growing religions in the world. We hear of what's happening around the world. There are some that are radical Islamists and so forth. But as far as the teaching of Islam, Islam does believe in Jesus. They believe in Jesus. In the Quran, there are nine times in the Quran where Jesus is mentioned. Isa is his name in the Quran. And they believe that Jesus was born of a virgin whose name was Mary. But what they don't believe is that Jesus, although he was a prophet and a good prophet, he is not the best prophet. Muhammad is the final prophet. They do not believe that Jesus died on the cross, and they do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Can I tell you something? What they're demonstrating is a spirit of Antichrist. Judaism, listen, I'm not attacking people, but I'm attacking doctrine, what people believe. Please don't understand the difference in that. Judaism will look at Jesus and they'll say that Jesus was indeed a prophet, but he was a misguided prophet. He had a messianic complex. He thought he was the Messiah, but he never made it past the cross and therefore he is not the Messiah. They are demonstrating a spirit of Antichrist. Mormonism comes along and they try to, and they sound good. They're commercial commercials look good and these are great wonderful friends and neighbors and certainly they are but their understanding of Jesus is the spirit of antichrist because they will teach that Jesus and Satan were brothers in eternity they are having an askewed understanding of who Jesus is Jehovah witnesses will knock on your door faithfully because they're committed to their cause and as they knock on your door though they'll use the common language of Christianity their understanding of Jesus is that Jesus is is not the name that is above every name. Jesus is a secondary deity. Jehovah is the great God and Jesus comes underneath him. But Jesus said he did not think it robbery to be equal with God. I'm simply telling you that the spirit of Antichrist is a spirit that prevails even in our world today. Even when we watch television today and we see television preachers who preach a prosperity or charismatic doctrine, who places a greater emphasis on what God can do for us rather than why we and what we can do for him. Now there's a measure of truth in what they say, but anytime you hear preaching that emphasizes man rather than Jesus, it's not the spirit of God, it's the spirit of error. Does that make sense to you? If it does, say amen. I'll tell you that we have a community and a world and a church that's being easily swayed by, by every wind of doctrine because they're hearing something that makes them feel good. And I'm telling you, feelings aren't 
important. God made us feeling creatures. He didn't make me as a puppet or to be stoic. He created me as an emotional being. But he never designed my emotions to control me. He said I, that the just will live by faith and not by feelings. So I want to test these feelings. Do the feelings that I have, are these feelings that are coming from God or are these feelings coming from another source? And the Bible says one way that I know the spirit of truth from the spirit of error is that the spirit of truth will always point people to Jesus Christ. It will always tell us that he is the way, the truth, and the life and no no man come unto the Father but by me. The Spirit of truth will always glorify Jesus. The Spirit of truth will never glorify man because in man there's nothing in us that's good worth glorifying except the one who is the great I am. And so the one who is the way, the truth, and the life lives within us. And the work of the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. I want you to see that in marketing there is a technique called bait and switch Companies will sometimes advertise a popular product at a low price. And when the customer comes into the brick and mortar store looking for the product, they tell them, we're sorry, it's out of stock. And we no longer will get it in. However, we have another item that's just as good. That's been the spirit of Antichrist. They're trying to present another Jesus, another religion that's just as good as the one we have. Listen, can I tell you this morning, this thing that you and I follow, the Christ that we're following, if, this, if Jesus is right when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes unto the Father but by me, there are not many ways to heaven, but there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. And the spirit of truth will always make much of Jesus. Sometimes folks fall, fall into the charismatic movement. Listen, I love my charismatic brothers and sisters. Many of them I know love Jesus more than I do. But I will tell you that the spirit of error will cause a man to focus more on the working of the spirit than on Jesus Christ. We ought to be aware of the gifts of the spirit and the operation of the spirit. But the spirit of truth will never talk about himself. The spirit Spirit of truth will always glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see a second question that surfaces here. The first thing you've got to ask yourself is, what do I believe about Jesus? Do I believe what the Bible says about him, that he's king of kings, lord of lords, he's fully human, and he's fully divine? Here's a second question you ought to ask yourself, the acid test. Not only what do you believe about Jesus, but secondly, who are you listening to? What is your source that you're listening to, right? When you hear the word or read the word here in verse 5 and 6, the word means to hear and to heed. Look at verse 5 and 6. He says, they are of the world. Therefore, they speak as the world and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us, and uh, he who is not of God does not hear us. You notice how many times the word hear is being used, right? And so it means not just to hear audibly. It means I'm going to hear and heed. It means I'm going to listen and respond to. Watch this. I don't want you to miss this, and I want to say this with the tender affection of someone who's given authority by God to speak, and that's this. Number one, those who belong to the world listen to the world. Those who belong to the world listen to the world. You realize that uh, when I'm using the word world, I'm not referring to the globe you and I live on. I'm, I'm referring to a world system of values and beliefs that stand contrary to the will of God. We see that pictured, for example, in Genesis when Noah and his sons get off of the ark and the Spirit of God says, go forth and multiply and cover the earth. But you know what they did, his descendants? They congregated on the plain of Shinar and built a tower. And as a result of the Tower of Babel, what was the result? Confusion. Can I tell you something? When a man or woman chooses to live their life apart from God's word and his will, the ultimate result in their life is confusion. Confusion in their thinking, confusion in their living. Can I just prove my point just but in terms of things that are happening in our country today? We have a nation today who's decided that they're not going to follow the principles of God's word. But what they're going to do is follow the dictates of their own conscience and their own heart and their own reason. It sounds impressive, Jonathan. Follow your heart. Follow your mind. Follow your own reason. But I will tell you the reality is the end result is confusion. I'll prove it to you. Several years ago in the, 
in the mid-90s, the Supreme Court decided to change the definition of marriage. They got away from what, the, what has been God's standard for many years. And as a result, Pandora's box was open and anything and anyone can marry anyone or anything. Right? We're confused about that. We're confused about sexuality. We're confused about gender identity. People are born with biological parts, but that doesn't mean that's what they are. And now we have a whole generation that's confused about who they are. You know where that confusion comes? The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. That if there's a confusing part in your spirit and in your heart, that didn't come from God. The Bible teaches us that those who belong to the world listen to the world. How does that apply to us, brother, right? For this reason. Do you know there's a lot of churches that at one time used to believe this, but now they believe that? They did a 180. I mean, I don't mean they just changed in congregation or changed a building or changed. I don't mean about that. I mean, there was times where churches were real strong and stood strong on the principles of God's word. And they said emphatically and boldly, this is wrong. But now, years later, because the culture has changed, the church has changed. I've got a picture you're well familiar with. I know you know what a chameleon is. A chameleon will change its colors based upon its environment, sometimes because of the temperature. Sometimes they'll change their colors because they're trying to attract a mate. I don't know what color that would be, right? But here's what I find out. A chameleon will adjust according to its environment. You know what's happened to a lot of churches? A lot of churches have decided to change according to their environment. Churches at one time were strong and bold and powerful in their preaching and strong against sin. Now they're allowing culture to dictate their convictions and they've changed completely where they once stand. What was once wrong is now right. What's now right was once wrong. And so things have changed. Why, Brother Ray? Because the Bible says those who belong to the world listen to the world. But conversely, verse 6, and I'm done, those who belong to God listen to His Word. Now, this is so important what I'm about to tell you as I, as I wrap up my thoughts. The word us in verse 6 is a reference to the apostles' teaching. There you notice in Acts chapter 2 that the church, the day of Pentecost came, people were filled with the Holy Spirit and saved. And the Bible said they continued in the apostles' teaching. What is he saying, Benny? He's saying that the Spirit of God, don't miss this, the Spirit of God who comes to live within you, how do I know the Spirit of God lives in me? Watch this and I'm finished. How do I know the Spirit of God lives within me? The Spirit of God who comes to live within me will cause me to want to live my life for Him. Do you see that? Because it's all about Jesus. It makes me want to live for Him. It also makes me want to live according to His Word. When I say that I'm a Christian, but I don't want His Word to have authority in my life, I say that I'm a Christian, but I live a lifestyle that's contrary to His Word and His revealed will, then I need to question whether what's in me is the Holy Spirit or an unholy spirit. You see, it's popular in our county, in our country today, to claim faith in God. To say that I'm a Christian and I belong to the Lord. And our culture readily embraces people, whether they come to church, whether they talk about Jesus, whether they live for His glory, and we say, you are as saved as I am. But John would back up and say, wait a minute, if the true Holy Spirit lives within you, the Spirit within you will lead you to worship the one who saved you and live according to his principles. Now, I, I, that doesn't mean perfection. We know we all sin and come short of the glory of God, but it does mean direction. It means that even though I may step into sin, I'm not going to stay in sin. God's Spirit is going to deal with me and draw me back unto Him. I'm not going to be comfortable in this muck and mire. Now listen, I know that you don't have to be a Baptist to go to heaven, but I figure if you're going anyway, you might as well go first class. Amen, right? Listen, I'm not at all saying you've got to be a Baptist to go to heaven. You've got to be a part of this denomination. I'm not saying that at all because Baptists don't have it all right. And can I just let you in on an ecumenical secret a moment? There is no denomination that has it all right. We're all messed up somewhere. But I'm telling you, what causes a man to be saved is not what denomination he is. It's whether the Spirit of the living God lives inside of him. That's what causes a person to be saved. Theologians call that regeneration. That's where God regenerates and changes the heart. I once was in love with this world, but now I'm in love with Jesus. 
You see that? I once wanted to do what the world wanted to do, but now the Spirit of God who lives within me leads me to do what God wants me to do. If I don't want to do what God wants me to do and I don't want to live for His glory, His Spirit does not live inside of me. Don't go to hell thinking you're saved that you can live a rebellious life and think you're saved. That's just good preaching. It's it's a reminder to us, listen, I'm not saved because I live righteously. I live righteously because I've been saved by God's grace. Some days I don't do good. Some days I do great. But what I am, I am by the grace of God. And I don't make an excuse for my sin. I recognize that God has to do something deep within me. I want to close with a story. You're done listening, I could tell. That glaze look in your eye that began about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> there was a church, John MacArthur talks about a church in England that uh, had a sign outside that simply read, We preach Christ crucified. And it was a powerful church. People were getting saved, lives were being transformed. And over the years, ivy began to grow up on that sign. And soon it covered the last word on that sign. It simply read, we preach Christ. And uh, still, things were happening. It was still a good church. Ivy continued to grow a year or two later, and it covered another word. We preach is now what the sign called. And then finally, after a couple years, the sign was completely engulfed in vines, and you couldn't read. And when that was covered up, the church died and was no longer vibrant and alive. You know what gives... I just have to be honest. If Coral Hill has any power to it, it's not because of the personality in the pulpit. It's not because of the programs. It's not because of our staff. I think we got great staff. I think we got a great church, and I'm thankful for it. But if there's any power here, it has nothing to do with the people who are, who, are, who are helping keeping the wheels going. You know what the heartbeat of Coral Hill is? We preach Christ crucified. He's the hope of the gospel. You know what will save your soul? Christ crucified. You know what will give you power? Christ crucified. And whenever any other message becomes the mantra of our fellowship, if we start making social issues our issue, if we make a social gospel, if it's about making you feel good and you feel comfortable and you're in your ease and you're happy, when it becomes about you, the power of God exits this place. How do I know the Spirit of God lives within me? I know He lives within me because He keeps calling me to look to Jesus and He keeps calling me to live by His Word. And when those two things are evident in my life, it's evidence that His Spirit lives inside of me. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your goodness this morning and how You're trying to teach us in Your Word that what gives the man or woman the assurance of their salvation is not the feelings and the emotions they demonstrated when they prayed, or even the feelings they had this morning. We sing the song this morning that I know that my God is real because I can feel Him. And that is true. We feel Him in us. But the way that I can authenticate the feeling is by examining my life to see whether the feeling comes from heaven or from hell. God, I pray in Jesus' name that as your word has gone forth today, I pray that people would know that I'm not attacking any one person but I am declaring truth and declaring it unashamedly. God, would you give us boldness? Would you give us strength? We're all sinners and we all need a Savior. And I pray, God, even this morning that you would speak in power as only you can. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you this question this morning. Is there anyone here this morning that the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart and you're saying, Brother Ray, as I've sat here today, God has dealt with my heart, maybe even before you came in. And you said, God has been speaking to me about my need to be saved. Would you pray for me? Would you pray that God would show mercy and save a sinner like me? If that's you, would you slip your hand up? We'll not come to you and embarrass you, but we'll come and pray for you. Anybody like that? God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Are there those here this morning that would say, Brother Ray, I'm a Christian. I know that Christ transformed me. But this thing of testing the spirit that, I, that, I've, that I've kind of got away a little bit. I'm not as close to Christ, and I'm not where I need to be, but God is dealing with my heart and calling me to be back in the center of his will and to follow his word. Brother Ray, pray for me that I'll follow the spirit of God. If that's you, would you slip your hand up and then just just drop it right down as soon as you're ready to drop it. I understand that. I know that. I know that. Jesus, 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 help us. Help us, Lord. Help that lost man and woman come to faith in Christ. Help them to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. God, help those brothers and sisters in Christ who 
Father, how easily it is we can be in church and still be a million miles away from you. God, I pray your Holy Spirit would put a passion in us and a hunger in us that we've not had for some time. That we would be anxious and desirous to see God do something great among us. God, would you do this for your glory and your honor? Would you help us to be true to your word and help us to exalt Jesus Christ? For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Randy's going to lead us in this song of invitation. If you need to come and pray, I want you to feel free to do that. Now is the time to respond to what God has been speaking to your heart about. Amen.